Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, our coral reefs around Florida are in jeopardy. How researchers are hoping to help reverse their decline. This is not your typical ambulance. This one can transport some of our animal friends in need. And we'll check in on a dog who, when we first met him, was dear death. We'll see how he's doing now. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes. I'm Marsha Panucci and this is my best friend, Zeus. They look like rocks, but in fact, coral reefs are made up of thousands of tiny animals and they are a vital part of marine ecosystems. We caught up with Moat Marine Laboratory to learn a little more about the research they are doing to help rebuild corals. Well, a lot of people ask me, what is a coral? They'll say, is it a plant? Is it an animal? Is it a mineral? Is it a microbe? And the answer to that is yes, 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 yes. It's all of those things. It's a small, tiny animal that is clear, like looks like a little hand. It's a little polyp or hydra. And inside it, it actually harbors and farms microalgae, a plant that lives inside its tissue, not on the outside, inside. That's what gives it its color. You probably look and see corals that may be colorful. The coral actually is animal is transparent. The algae is what give it its color. But if the temperatures get too warm, it actually, the plant inside, just like any good plant, produces with photosynthesis some food and some oxygen. We like plants because it provides the oxygen we breathe. But at high temperatures, the animal, just like us on a big day, will not like to run a marathon when it's super hot. But the trees like to photosynthesize very quickly. And that's what happens with the corals. The algae starts producing oxygen at an enormous rate inside the tissue of the coral, which on a normal metabolism would utilize some of the oxygen and transport some out of its skin into the water. When it's really slow and too hot, it can't get the oxygen out in time and it's gonna die because of literally oxygen poisoning. Somehow the animal tells all the algae, you're killing me, get out of here, you're gone. And overnight they leave somehow, we don't know how it happens. And the animal then looks white because you're seeing through the clear animal to the white calcium carbonate, the mineral stone that it's making as its skeleton. That's called coral bleaching has nothing to do with Clorox, has nothing to do with bleach. It's basically losing the color so it looks white. The animal's still alive, but maybe only for a number of weeks. It's lost its ability now to get some of its food. It's also lost its immune system. The algae also gives some of its energy to the coral and some of its energy to a specific microbe community that lives on the outside of the coral polyp in its mucus that produces a naturally occurring antibiotic and becomes the immune system of the coral. This is a wild organism. This is an organism that's made up of three different classes, divisions, phylas of organisms all working together. So it's really pretty crazy and it produces a calcium carbonate mineral stone as its skeleton. So it's really all four. It's a mineral, animal, plant, mineral, microbe. So we know very little about these corals. And now that we know more, and know these four different organisms all living as one, it's actually a lot more complicated than we thought. Regretfully, they are one of the first things susceptible to these higher temperatures and ocean acidification. Two things, the one-two punch that we're doing to our oceans that we shouldn't be. Most people know that plants are actually what produce oxygen as a byproduct. Most people think it's coming from the rainforest, but the rainforest and the land plants are actually only supplying about a third to a little less than one half of the world's oxygen. The rest of the oxygen comes from our oceans, and that comes from the algae that is in the plankton stage, in a massive stage like seaweeds, 
in sea grasses as well as the algae that lives inside the animal of a coral. And so every other breath that we take, we really should be thanking our oceans. Corals are less than 1% of the bottom of the ocean, less than 1%, but they're responsible for 25 to 40% of our world fisheries. It's where the fish go to feed, to breed, and to hide from other predators. If we lost all of our coral reefs, we'd literally lose most of our world's fisheries. So if you like eating seafood and you like to breathe, I would pay attention to what's happening in our oceans and pay attention to what's happening to our corals. A quarter of all ocean species actually depend on coral reefs. They are an important resource for food and shelter. And when it comes to discovering new medicines, researchers are developing those from coral reefs as well. We've all seen them, ambulances. But this one doesn't transport people. Instead, it's on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to move animals who are in need of help. You just want to help them. It's, I mean, they've had such a hard life. Over the years, Bill Barnack has fostered more than a dozen dogs from Golden Retriever Rescue of Southwest Florida. They're the special needs, uh, they're also the hospice ones. Uh, they have a difficult time placing them. Uh, a lot of people, they try to get a two or three year old perfect male puppy. And uh, the rescue, you know, is very good. Uh, they'll take in dogs from all ages, you know, all types. Uh, and if they get an older, you know, sick one or one that, you know, needs a little help or some extra visits to the vet, uh, they somehow seem to call me now. And Sergey was one of those dogs in need of help. Being part of a criminal case of abuse, Sergey came to Bill with a dislocated shoulder and a bad urinary tract infection. Just a few days with Bill, Sergey got worse. Uh, the urinary tract infection uh, was really starting to take a toll on his nervous system and it was just, the vet calls it that he was starting to crash, that, that the organs were starting to shut down. We're fully equipped, fully trained. We call ourselves kind of pet paramedics. Sergey was in bad shape, so Bill called Vet Care Express the pet ambulance. Sergey um, had such a bad UTI that he was really down. He, he, he was not looking well at all. Um, he had to be stretchered uh, and gurneyed down to animal yard. ER. So Sergey had a uh, urinary catheter in him, so, um, and he was down, so he needed the stretcher gurney. Um, and extra sets of hands to be able to get him safely to Animal Yark. An attendant sits right here. We're usually on the floor so that we can be down next to them, giving them kisses and, and assuring them that they're okay. Vet Care Express has transported more than 8,700 pets in their service area. That's what we want to be as a resource, you know, to all the vet offices, all the ERs, and to every pet owner. We just want to be a resource for them. And they were a valuable resource for Sergey who now is feeling better and happy to be reunited with those that helped in his recovery. It gives me a peace of mind and it's kind of a comforting feeling that the dogs will be well taken care of and I'm not trying to load a sick dog that might have a bleeding tumor or something and twist them, getting them into my van, my truck. Uh, they're very caring, uh, you know, understanding. Uh, they're available 24 hours a day. Great service. There is a critical need for animal ambulances and hopefully they start to become a typical sight all over the country. If you would like more information on VetCare Express, visit them at VetCareExpress.com. Don't slither away, more animal outtakes is coming up. You can be sure your furry friend continues to be loved and cared for even when you can no longer be there for them. Dante's Den provides a permanent loving home for dogs whose owners have set up a lifetime care program for their beloved companion. We honor the trust placed in us by providing loving care, spacious dens, on-site veterinary care, and plenty of room to run and play. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. Dante's Den, continuing the love.
Crested Caracara is listed in Florida as threatened. Their numbers have declined due to many factors, including illegal hunting. Help support efforts to eliminate the threat of illegal hunting, not just for birds of prey, such as the Caracara, but for all wildlife. Always alert authorities if you see people hunting illegally, or if you see wildlife parts, such as feathers, being sold illegally. Welcome back. You know, season after season, this show has made me experience animals I never thought I'd have a chance to get up close to, especially the next one, one of the largest kinds of snakes in the world. Terry, we've all seen that movie. Anaconda, and um, here's the star. She will hide if you talk about that. Oh, movie. really? Yeah, really? She will hide. Yeah. <laughs> this is um, a green anaconda. It is. It's, and it's what is man. her what is her going weight right now? Oh, let's see. He's probably 25, maybe 30 pounds. Now, the anacondas are arguably the largest snakes on the planet. Um, whether or not they're the longest, they are definitely the heaviest. Um, I have one that is around 540 pounds. Oh my goodness. Uh, and I brought her into captivity in 1969, and she was 18 feet long at the time. She's an old snake, and uh, anacondas probably live longer than any of the other big snakes do. So you're looking at 70 years, maybe, for, for a great big anaconda. You know, this begs the question. Sure. Why would you do this? Why would you devote your life to the medical herbatologist that you are and conservationist, but snakes? First of all, one of the answers that I give people is a snake is basically a lizard with no legs. There's not a lot of difference. Snakes are some of the most misunderstood creatures on the planet. They really are. And how about a little factoid for you? Sure. There are more naturally tame snakes than any other land vertebrate. Really? Yeah. In other words, animals that you could go up to out in the wild, pick up, and not get torn to bits by. Pick up a squirrel someday and see what happens. Oh, well, they're as mean as, <laughs> mean as skunks, we I, say. I have, I have, yeah. <laughs> People think warm and fuzzy means gentle. Uh, once you have a snake that you've worked with and, uh, as we say, proof them, they've, they've become accustomed to you, become accustomed to people, become accustomed to what we do. Uh, you virtually could not force that animal to bite. You know, in, in so many century-old paintings in that, we see the snakes, especially the medical caduceus, yes. we see the snakes. The Ascapalian snakes. Yes. Mm -hmm. How far back do these guys go? Way back. Way back. Uh, the problem with snakes is they don't fossilize very well. So you rarely see them. Their bones are very fine and very small. The truth is we're not 100% sure how far the snakes go back. Um, likely their ancestor was something like a monitor lizard. Really? Yeah. But somewhere along the line, they lost, they the lost legs. those legs. Right. But, but how fast can they go? They're not very quick. Snakes oh. are not usually very fast animals. But we're going to see the vestiges of the legs here. See that claw? Yes. They have a little pelvic girdle in there and two vestigial limbs. I've never seen that. Yeah. One of the things about snakes that people don't realize is they have no eyelids. Oh, I realize it because I'm now, right up close. Now, you have a problem when you have a pet snake. And everybody should know this about a pet snake. You don't know if that snake's awake or asleep. Ah. People will say, oh, I have this wonderful pet boa. It's never bitten anybody. And I just went in there the other day and bit my hand. Did you wake it up first? Remember, he can't see. What, what are things like for you, Marsha, when you open up your eyes in the morning? Only Dirty Harry can pull out his gun and shoot three people accurately. It takes us well, five without minutes. My, well, without my three cups of coffee, I'm not seeing <laughs> there anything. There you go. <laughs> Would you recommend that an anaconda be a no. pet? No. Okay. Anacondas are difficult to keep. Very hard to get them to feed. They are not appropriate except for somebody who's really serious about what they're doing. But you know, I'm just looking at him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> does he have a name? No. This one does not well, have a name. He's part look, of a breeding group that we have. Oh, well, you kind of look like an Oliver. What do you think? So it is. 
Oliver, it is. Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, we, we thank you for coming today. Yes, we do. And I think you're ticklish. Yes, I do. <laughs> Green anacondas are good swimmers and can stay under the water for more than 10 minutes at a time. He was neglected and staff here at Dante's Den thought he might not make it. We'll see how Bear is doing now. Next. People have asked me what it'll cost to restore all the corals back the way they remember. But I have to ask them, what will it cost if we don't do anything? We didn't know much about the life Bear had before he was brought into Dante's den about a year ago. But from the condition of Bear, he was extremely mistreated to say the least. Let's take a look back. When we called you in, Dr. Glassman, other than the medical, which you assessed immediately and quite well, what did you really think? Well, he's a sweet dog, obviously. Uh, he's very happy. You can see him you know, wagging his tail. He wants affection. Um, the only thing that the owners evidently did do was give him some food because he wasn't skinny and you know, a bag of bones like we see some animals. So he actually was fed, but I imagine it seems like he probably was just kept in a yard and they threw him food and that was probably about it because certainly he never went to a veterinarian and had any uh, real medical care. Bear was a very sick dog. For the first week he was here at Dante's Den, he couldn't even lie down. He was in total discomfort. Scabies affected his entire body. The tiny skin parasite caused scabs and hair loss, making Bear have a constant and severe itch. But with the help of staff and doctors and months of something Bear hadn't received before, love, Bear is feeling much better. Well, Bear medically uh, has really good skin now compared to when he came in with probably the worst case of scabies I've ever seen. And there was so much damage to his skin and hair follicles that he's still pretty much bald. He has a few hairs. Uh, I have a few more than him, not that much more. But uh, he, he's really happy, he's healthy, he's not itchy, he's not scaly anymore. Uh, and he'll, I'm sure, be bald pretty much for the rest of his life because of all the severe damage to the hair follicles. But he's happy and healthy. He doesn't have to part his hair like I do. Look at him go! Look at him go! Bear had a very large, ugly-looking mass on his left flank. And I actually thought it was going to be a cancer, a neoplasia. But fortunately, it, it shrunk on its own a little bit. And then we removed it in its entirety. And it came back as a benign tumor. So that was really good. Uh, so yeah, overall, he's doing very well. What has surprised me is the fortitude that this dog had. Um, he came to us near death, 
uh, and we prayed and we worked with him and just to see him so happy and healthy, healthy. And he's truly our miracle. He is our miracle baby. Did you ever see such a happy dog? He's happy. He's happy. <laughs> There are many dogs out there like Bear who are in need of a loving home. And if you would like to see how you can help or if you're interested in adoption, visit dantesden.org. We'll be right back with some tips from one of our trusted vets. Every dog deserves a lifelong loving home. Dante's Den provides a pristine, comfortable haven for dogs that have been abandoned or surrendered by their owners. We ensure that every pup in our Joyful Dogs Adoption Program receives lots of love and attention, is properly immunized, spayed or neutered, and is in good health. Prospective pet parents undergo a thorough adoption review to ensure a lifetime of love and care. Find your new furry best friend at Dante's Den. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. Dante's Den, continuing the love. Thanks for staying with us. What are we going to talk about today, Benson? <gasps> Cats? Dr. Glassman, we're here today with Putty. And Putty is about two years old and just full of you know what and you know what. <laughs> and uh, there are some diseases that we have to look for in cats. Mm -hmm. One of them being? Uh, hyperthyroidism I'd like to talk about today. Um, not a disease of young cats, a disease of older cats in general, at least eight or nine years of age. Uh, very common old age disease, maybe number two, kidney disease probably number one hyperthyroidism or overactive thyroids is probably number two. And they eat more, they lose weight. We could all use a little of that. Yeah, that's not so bad. Uh, sometimes they'll vomit more. Uh, they will drink and urinate more. Uh, they may be hyperactive. They may be, you know, uh, higher levels of activity or they may be lethargic because they're sick. So a lot of different ways they present, but pretty easy to diagnose with some basic blood work. Uh, the thyroid test is part of basic blood for liver and kidney function. 
and we would check red and white cells, make sure we're not missing anything. But pretty easy to diagnose in general and very uh, sort of a good disease, I always tell people for all cats, because there's four ways to treat it. Uh, the old days, we used to do surgery to remove the thyroid gland. The thyroid sits in the neck just below the, the voice box, the larynx, and your veterinarian will palpate the neck, and you can actually feel enlarged thyroid glands most of the time on these cats. But you can't make the diagnosis that way. You still have to do the blood work. And we can remove, surgically remove that, and that's a cure. We can send them for a one-time radiation treatment to a special center which is not the kind of radiation with big machines where you think of with people with chemotherapy, but it's just an injection under the skin of a radioactive iodine, and it goes into the thyroid because the thyroid uses iodine to make the thyroid hormone, and they sit in a cage for four or five days and then go home. Not cheap, about $1,500 plus work up at your veterinarian ahead of time for another few hundred, so it's probably about a $2,000 treatment, but it is also a cure and probably the best for your cat if you can afford it. The other common, medi uh, there's a me common medicine called tapazole or methimazole. It's a human drug and used for the same thing I understand in people, where you give it every day and it actually suppresses the thyroid function. So this is a medicine they need every day for life. And then there's a food, a new s a food that came out, oh, maybe six or eight years ago. It's a low iodine food and that will control some cats just by feeding a low iodine food. So it's sort of a good disease for old cats because there's lots of ways to treat it. And it can be cured. Yes, with surgery or uh, radiation. And at what age would you consider that we look at this? Is it uh, eight to nine years of age, I start recommending doing a senior blood panel for older cats at seven, eight years of age to screen because these diseases come on slow, like a lot of old age diseases, and you won't notice it till it gets modestly advanced. So seven or eight is a good time to do senior screenings and look for some of these diseases. So you have a long way to go, Putty. We hope you've had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. Zeus and I will be back next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. Go. Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Go. <laughs> Wrong side. Hey. Hey. Come on over here. Come on. This is going to be a trying time.